We have our final speaker, esteemed colleagues of the day, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We have Brian Elliott, who's here from California. He's the executive leader of Future Forum. He is a senior vice president at Slack as well. Brian, welcome to MTech Next. I will let you take it away. The floor is yours to give your presentation. I'll be back in a minute. So I'm going to give Kevin a little bit of a break here from uh, being on stage and talking. Instead, I'm going to talk at you for a few minutes. Uh, I'm Brian Elliott. I'm the executive leader of a group called Future Forum. We're a consortium backed by Slack, along with our partners at Boston Consulting Group, Miller Knoll, and Management Leadership for Tomorrow. I'm going to talk to you about some of the data, some of the research that we've been doing over the past two years. It's stuff that actually backs up a lot of what you've been hearing over the past couple of days, including what Katie was just sharing with you. Future Forum Pulse is our quarterly survey of over 10,000 knowledge workers around the globe. It's our way of understanding habits and practices and what's working and what's not for people. And we've been using that to sort of dig in and understand what's going on from a talent perspective. And the reason why we're focused on talent is because it's actually the number one issue. From a com competition perspective, when you ask CEOs, almost no matter what's going on these days, whether it's pandemic, whether it's supply chain, inflation, talent is still the number one issue on their agenda. And it's understandable because good people who you attract, retain, engage, instill purpose in, and get them marching together in, in common cause is what drives business results. It's not financial capital or physical capital, it's talent. And so being able to attract and retain and engage those people not only delivers happier employees, it delivers happier customers and bigger customer engagement. The challenge that we're all finding is the rules have changed dramatically over the course of the pandemic. People's expectations about work have changed tremendously. Talent expects flexibility. 71% of people around the globe, if they are unhappy with the flexibility that their employer is giving them, are open to new job opportunities. Flexibility in where and when people work is now table stakes. It's second only to compensation and people's consideration about what they're looking for. And when we say flexibility, what usually gets wrapped up in this is whether or not Elon Musk is saying five days a week back in the office or someone else is giving you a day or two a week to work from home. The truth behind that particular stat about where people work is people have their own opinions. You heard of this a bit from Katie, 79% of people in our survey around the globe want some form of flexibility. There's about 20% of people that want or need to be in the office five days a week. But of that 79%, most people want to come together but they want to come together for purpose. They don't want to come together for command performance. They want to come together to build relationships, to get to know one another, to build bonds, and maybe to kick off a project or two. But they don't want to do it because they're told to do it. They want it through choice and autonomy. The other part that doesn't get talked about nearly as much that's actually more important is schedule flexibility. 94% of people tell us that they want and need schedule flexibility. And when they say that, they don't mean a free-for-all either. What most people, two-thirds of them want, is some more limited set of hours so that nine to five, five days a week isn't turned into a free-for-all of meetings. So that you're not playing this game of Tetris, attempting to find a one-hour block to get your work done during the day, or what is happening in reality, which is that work gets pushed until nine o'clock at night after dinner and after the kids are in bed. People are looking for ways in which they put some form of guardrails in place. My own team does core collaboration hours. It's similar to the graphic on the, on the display, which is Dropbox's team hours around the globe. So for my team, 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. is fair game for one-on-ones, for team meetings, for cross-functional meetings. That makes it much easier for us as a North America-wide team to make sure that people aren't on the East Coast working well into the evening or the West Coast having to get up early and take those conversations. Finding ways to put some constraints on schedules is really important, not only in terms of people's well-being, but in terms of the productivity of your organization. Now, all this work around flexibility has different connotations for different groups. When we started our research back in the summer of 2020, one of the first things that we found is that sense of belonging with my team dropped on average. The on average words are really important here because it turns out that it actually dropped for white office workers. Sense of belonging with my team rose for black and Hispanic Latinx office workers in the summer of 2020. We, I was personally surprised at this. I haven't, don't have the lived experience. We got a group of academic experts together and Brian Lowry from Stanford was the first one to say this out loud. It's code switching that he as a black professor, even on Stanford's campus, felt the challenge of five days a week, nine to five needing to be on 
You didn't feel like he had to watch where and how and he presented himself. Even a day or two a week from home gave him an opportunity to recharge his batteries. What we've seen over the past two years is that sense of belonging on teams on average actually rose to the point now where sense of belonging is actually higher for teams that have hybrid or flexible working arrangements than it is for people full-time in the office. But it's actually risen the fastest for black, Hispanic, and Asian American office workers to the point where those are the groups that are much more likely to say they need flexibility. The second group, and perhaps obvious, is caregivers. In particular, in the US and in the UK, where there's less infrastructure for it, we're actually talking about women with children. Women with children in the first quarter of this year, 57% of them told us that they want to work from home uh, three days a week or more. 48% of men with children said the same thing. And by the way, both of those groups, that percentage grows every quarter that we look at it. The needs and demands of uh, being present with your team are in conflict at times with caregiving status. Finding a way to make sure that you are creating flexibility for those teams is important. That's why Katie's right when she said your diversity, equity, and inclusion goals and your flexible work, uh, future work plans are tied together whether you know it or not. The third group, and some of you have probably felt this uh, personally, uh, I know of one person in the audience who, who did, is people who were remote workers pre-pandemic or literally anybody who worked in a satellite office that wasn't headquarters suddenly found themselves on a much more level playing field uh, with everybody else inside their organization. There's a engineering director out of Denver for us, a guy named Mike Brevoort, who coined the phrase, Slack is our headquarters internally. And for Mike, it wasn't a catchy marketing phrase. It was the fact that Mike made 23 trips to San Francisco in 2019. He made those trips not only to be with the teams he was working with, but most of the time, he made those trips to be in the room where it happens, to be in a conversation with our chief product officer, our CTO, our CEO, in order to be present for those, because he felt it was important to either get his, his point across or for career development. The risk that we run in all this, and when you get into the concept of proximity bias, it's because the desires of executives, of people like me at times, are different from non-executives. 72% of executives who've been working fully remote tell us they want to be in the office three days a week or more, almost the exact opposite answer for non-executives. So getting people to understand how they're going to balance those two out and avoiding the sort of faux flexibility, avoiding executives who are saying, you can be flexible as much as you want, but they're all showing up five days a week in the corner suite, is a real challenge. The same is true in the opposite extent. If they're saying you've got to be in five days a week, but they're not showing up, again, your team is not seeing you walk your talk. The good news, to some degree, is 41% of those executives tell us that proximity bias is one of their core concerns about hybrid and flexible work conditions. The bad news is it's only 41%. How do you bridge all these gaps? Um, I also love the phrase about, you know, I started off with a Palm Pilot. Um, I actually started off uh, prior to email, so that ages me more than a bit. Um, the tools and technology that we use and how we use them has dramatically shifted. When I joined Slack almost five years ago, the focus was entirely on productivity. And when people would talk about Giphy, the app, or a water cooler channel, a lot of the senior executive reaction would be, why do we need that stuff? The last two years, that's changed dramatically because digital tools help build connection and community. And in fact, when we look at the difference between people who are technology innovators and technology laggards, you get a 50% boost in people's assessment of their productivity, but you get almost a 2x uh, boost in their sense of belonging scores. So finding ways for people to bridge the, the getting together, the coordination, uh, the communication in person with continuous use of digital tools to bridge those gaps on an ongoing basis is really critical. Last but not least, um, Kevin's going to help me out here a little bit as we actually try to wrap this session up. If you're here and physically in the audience, uh, we just published a book. It's called How the Future Works. It actually walks through a series of steps uh, that will help you. It's gathered not only from the research, but from work we've done, not only at Slack, but great case studies from Levi Strauss, from IBM, Dropbox, Genentech, uh, a range of other companies, helping people understand some of the practices, experiments, and tools that other people have been using. And we'll probably use the book or a copy or two as a lure for all of you who stayed to the end to ask a question. Um, all of the research that I just shared with you is available online, futureforum.com if you're interested. So Kevin, come on up. Great. Thank you, Brian, for coming.
I have three copies of Brian's book here, and those of you who stay to the end, and if you ask a question, whether online or in the audience here, um, we have a copy of the book for you. So if, if we have I'm sufficient gonna put, time and you're here, we'll get you a copy afterwards. And, and, and online, Brian's, and online uh, reach out to me and we'll figure out a way. We'll to figure out a way to get it. One thing that's striking, Brian, listening to you, and I should say that I have read this book, and if you go to Charter, I've actually reviewed this book and said it was a great summary of, of the best practices and the research and what we know uh, right now. So I, I, I can I personally sweat, recommend it. Kevin knows this. I actually sweated his review more than almost anybody else's <laughs> because he does review everything, and he He's not always gentle in his reviews. So it was, it was a great well, idea. so I have some questions for you, Brian. Do it. So um, one thing that's really striking, just watching your presentation, is everything that was true a year ago became even more true over that time. And you're talking about it in, in terms of the inclusion statistics. So the numbers actually just like kept going up and up. And the expectations of workers and to some extent executives around flexible work actually started, kept going up and up. And it's, it's sort of, we, we forget how a year ago, we just imagine that we would, at this time, a year ago, we imagine, oh, we'll just all be back in our offices in September. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I hate to say this, but it's thanks to Delta and Omicron that, that pro there's been an even more sweeping change in expectations about work flexibility that you, you've just written the book on. Is that a fair, is that a fair observation? I think, it's, I think it's a reasonable observation. I think part of this is just this, the shock to the system that we went through overall. I mean. Uh, at Slack, I also, besides leading Future Forum, I also lead our task force on future of work internally. And most people don't know this. Slack itself was a hugely office-centric culture pre-pandemic. We were less than 3% remote uh, going into all of this. So we ourselves, like everybody else, imagine blindly that, you know, six weeks from now, we're all going to be back in the office. So let's just hunker down and, and we'll all come back. And it actually took a quarter or two for us to wrap our heads around what had changed here. And I think it took other people longer, and it's still taking some people even longer, but the challenge has been we've had decades and decades and decades of conventional wisdom that's been built up around mythology about what, how work happens around things like randomness and water coolers and all the rest of it, because it worked for people who did succeed, right? And because the randomness worked, or the systems worked for people who did succeed, that then sometimes gets imposed you know, down the rest of the organization when technology has changed, circumstances have changed, demographics have changed wildly, and the competitive nature of business has also changed. So I think the blessing, if there is one, of the past two years is two years into this, there's a lot that you've had to invest in and change as an organization to figure it out. And you've seen a wider range of examples than just technology companies doing this. This is why I love talking about like Genentech, which has people that are in R&D labs and manufacturing as well as finance, as well as sales, or Royal Bank of Canada, which is in the financial services sector, where the nature of the change is very different than it has been for Slack, for HubSpot, for other organizations like us. Can you just talk about Slack for a minute? Because you were in, in the room for the, the shift, which was pretty dramatic from a company that really was not barely remote at all to one that is now in sync with this flexible work work approach that you're um, that you're envisioning. And what was key to, to, to the, make that happen? There were probably two phases of that conversation. Was when, one was early on, and it was the concerns that I think a lot of people and organizations have, which is first there are the, the concerns about productivity, and that all got resolved pretty quickly. It was quickly supplanted by concerns for individuals, right? So we're all watching and sweating people who are dealing with illness, caregiving situations, really challenging home environments, um, deaths in the family, and much more focused on, on that side of things. The productivity side, you know, we all watched and saw solve itself, but the next set of questions were around innovation, right? Can we really be innovative if we don't have the whiteboard? Um, and the answer to which was, you found other ways that actually turned out were better. My own team is big fans of this concept called brain writing. Uh, which is, you know, take the research report, spend some time on it before we all get together, write out what you think are the most salient observations, throw those five things into a common doc at the beginning of the conversation so that you're not group filtering on it. We had a bunch of experiments where teams within Slack were trying things like that that actually got, as a senior leadership perspective, people comfortable that we could continue to grow and innovate and do things differently. So that was relatively straightforward. The harder set of conversations were when things started opening back up. And it was not the question of, are we going to hire more people to work remotely? It was, as the offices come available again, uh, Nadia Rawlinson, who's our chief people officer uh, at, at the time, said a really salient question, are we looking forward from where we are today, or are we looking backwards to 2019 and where we were? 
And the reason why is you've got to really kind of reset your mind and think about, is the office just another tool that we're adding into it or is the central, is the central point? And from an executive perspective, what that meant was we had to have a lot of harder conversations about how we as executives were going to show back up. Uh, and Stuart uh, actually led a lot of these conversations in the direction of how many days a week do you think you actually need to be in the office and why? Why are you coming in? Um, are you coming in for teams and for customers and events? Or are you coming in because it's more comfortable for you? And kind of went around the room. We actually even shifted how we run a lot of, for example, the product reviews. So the traditional problem and the reason why a Mike Brevort would fly from Denver is a product review would be an opportunity for somebody at a mid-level to present to the CTO and the CPO of the organization. It might happen for somebody a couple of times a year. You feel a lot of pressure to be in the room where it happens if you're, that, if you're given that opportunity. All of those reviews have stayed purely digital. And in fact, there's not a conference room that's allowed to be booked in the old headquarters building to avoid people gathering and congregating to try to keep that meeting, which has a big power dynamic behind it, to be a level playing field. And so executives doing that, leading by example, was a big part of the focus in terms of how do we think about what we're going to do going forward to make sure this is that we are preserving that level. So you can't book the conference room so that everyone is, has to be on their own computer, basically, yeah. for that meeting. There's, Katie alluded to it earlier. There are people who, um, you know, Elon Musk is the chief spokesman now in opposition to your book, basically, or the flexible working, <laughs> working approach. So you have that going for you. It's probably a good thing. He's, you know, I'm sure he's going to be attacking you on Twitter uh, any day now. Um, but... Um, what are the, you, and you've wrote this great piece for Charter and Time on the myths that, uh, that, the, that what Elon Musk and others are, are opposing to this flexible approach, opposed to it, the chief myths that they're, um, that they're basing this on. And maybe, can you quickly run through some of those and, and, and sure. what, the, what the counter argument is? The first thing I'd say is, like, I don't have the hubris to say that Elon's wrong, because for certain organizations, he may be right. There's 20% of people remember that want to be in the office five days a week, and maybe he attracts and gets all of them together. That's not going to be a very diverse group of people based on the data and what we see out there, and I think it creates a set of other problems. I think the challenge is there's a lot of mythology that's rooted in presenteeism and hustle culture, right? Which is just because I'm in at eight, because uh, Jane is in at 8 a.m. and leaves at 8 p.m., that Jane's a great worker and therefore we should reward Jane. I've had chief uh, uh, executive officers say, you know, that was me once upon a time. doesn't mean that I was working all of those hours. It just meant that I was there and I was present mm -hmm. and I was show, uh, doing the show. So I think there's a big benefit in the first place to not thinking about attendance and hours to thinking about outcome-driven metrics um, as the way in which you manage and lead teams because it produces better outcomes for the organization. The other two that are, that are, uh, that are big ones are uh, whiteboards in the first place, right? We really need a whiteboard to get back from a creativity and innovation standpoint. The challenge is most whiteboard people who are saying that are the people that like to hold the pen, that like to stand at the front of the room and that like to conduct a whiteboarding session. And by the way, they more often than not look like me. They're kind of loud. They might be a little bit older. They might be a little whiter uh, in nature. Um, and they like that audience uh, perspective. There's evidence out there from an academic perspective that actually shows that those sessions more often result in groupthink because people who have heretical ideas, different ideas, new ideas are more likely to sit on their hands, especially if they don't look like the majority, they are younger, they are newer to your organization. So finding ways to bridge by using tools and technology and processes like uh, uh, brain writing can help close some of those gaps. The other is the water cooler. The water cooler is all of a sudden taken on this mythological, mythological um, uh, status within organizations. That must be the greatest way to connect people. And, and the idea is random collisions of people at the water cooler are way the, the best ideas are. Yeah, are exactly. Yeah. And, and most people don't move off of their floor in the first place. So the odds that two groups uh, collide on a regular basis is really low. You can actually engineer those collisions if you want to. I'm a yeah. personal huge fan of an app called Donut in Slack that helps you engineer uh, linkages between people. But you can also find ways to do it that are actually bringing groups together you know, across groups with intention of you know, provoking more of those ideas and getting them to happen and not relying on random chance uh, to bring that together. So I want to go to, to questions in a minute and give people a chance to get your book. And we have some questions coming in. Um, one of them is, uh, but I want to ask one quick question before we, uh, before we do that. And that is um, this idea of meetings. So like my observation of looking at a lot of things that the greater flexibility, uh, four day work week, a lot of ideas that are actually getting a bit more currency now around what work could be. The single thing that stands in 
uh, greatest obstruction to these things is the quantity and the length of meetings Absolutely. that we all are dealing with. And so that's your your observation also. And and what is it? What do you? What's your advice? I'm, for, I'm a big fan of experimenting around how you think about manager schedules. There's ideas like core collaboration hours that I was describing earlier that my team does. Um, no internal meetings Fridays as a good starting point. Like yeah. it, what it does is it may just compress all of your meetings into the first four days of the week. But even if it does, that means people get heads down, focus time on Friday to get uh, the work done with a bigger chunk of time. And that's better than not doing it at all. And then I love um, what in Slack, we call it Maker Week. Uh, uh, Salesforce uh, has been doing this with what they call async weeks now as they've been growing it, which is once a quarter taking a week where you cancel all of your recurring meetings. Mm -hmm. Right. And that gives people a break, but it also is an opportunity to sit there and go, do I need all those meetings? Mm -hmm. Do they need to happen every week? Does the 20 people that are now in it, do they all need to be in that meeting? Are there other ways in which I can structure this? So it's a very hard problem to solve on the whole. You've got to chip away at it. You've got to experiment, iterate and put support behind it to make it work. Great. OK. Do we have a question here? OK. We have a question. In the back there, and you get a book. Come find Ooh. us after. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I am Ferus Getty. I am head of HR Innovation in Capgemini. And Great. thanks a lot for sharing this uh, very relevant research for doing my job. It's not easy, as you mentioned, to attract talent, and especially in our field in AI, cyber, and cloud. So my question, I would be very curious to uh, have your view on what they specifically need, the Gen Z, in the workplace? Because we heard the, the one thing and the contrary. Some research said they want to come at the office. Other research said, no, Gen Z, they want to work remotely. Yeah. So, and I, I don't have a stronger conviction on that. So I would be very, very curious to have your view on this topic on Gen Z specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. So the, the, from a data perspective, um, there's, there's a lot of mythology there. That group is the one that's least likely to want either poll. They're least likely to want to be five days a week in the office, and they're least likely to want to be fully remote. People who are 50 and over are the ones that are most likely to want both ends of the spectrum. The nice part is there's a happy median between the two, which is how do you get people to think about um, how you uh, come together on an, on an episodic basis to help build belonging and culture and all the rest of it. Gen, from our data and some of the stuff that we've been looking at, there's real opportunities to rethink a couple things. One is they have a heavy focus on career development. So thinking about how you're going to help them, not just with the current job that you're hiring them for, but how is this a stepping stone for them, either internally or externally, is a big deal. The other is we've all had to spend two years rethinking and reimagining onboarding processes. And there's a lot of mythology around like the onboarding process is much better if it's in the office. The truth is the onboarding process is much better if you've intentionally thought through it. If you've not only done the paperwork and the administration and the meeting of people, but you've thought through, they don't just get a manager, they get a mentor. If you've thought about how, how ways in which you actively help them network in their organization. One of my favorite tips uh, comes from an organization that started doing this called uh, GenPact out of Europe, which has started doing Everybody the onboard gets six people to meet. They're outside of their team, and those six people are asked to give them three more. So help them build networks by being very proactive about how you do it. That's great. Okay, we have a question uh, online here. Um, have you? It's a question from Catherine. Did your survey results change when you're looking at global companies and teams? Was there anything that stood out? If so it, the, the, the survey itself is actually broad based in terms of uh, large scale companies, mid sized companies, smaller companies, the exec side skews to Fortune 500 executives. Um, we actually see differences globally uh, by country. So Japan, for example, back in Q1 went much more heavily back into the office and saw a much more dramatic fall off in uh, uh, well-place and wor uh, work being, uh, well-being well -being, issues, well -being yeah. issues and stress. Um, in larger organizations, there's more complexity, but there's also a lot of mythology here because people assume that, for example, engineers are the ones who want full flexibility and salespeople want to be in the office. That's not true. Um, salespeople and engineers both want flexibility. Um, salespeople are more often being pushed to be in the office and engineers are more often given flexibility. But human desires remain the same, which is I want autonomy and choice, and I want to come together w with my team for a purpose, not for a command performance. Great. We have time maybe for one more question in our third book. Um, have you looked at, this is from Ali, have you looked at emerging technology that simulates employees working remotely but working together in next door offices or cubicles? 
Um, not that specifically. At Slack, one of the things that we did do uh, about a year into the pandemic was we actually struck a deal with WeWork to give people who needed access to office mm -hmm. space, because keep in mind, there's still that percentage of people that home does not accommodate. There are people that either need space or they need the uh, disconnect between home and the office environment. And I do think no matter what your setup is as an organization, making sure those people have access to dedicated space where they can be effective and be productive is actually critically important. Um, we're just about out of time, but there is a question from Barbara, which I am interested in the answer to. So it is, what are you most curious about? <laughs> what am I not curious about these days? <laughs> I, I think a lot of what we're actually starting to think about and look at now is not only knowledge workers, office workers, but how does this play out across um, uh, frontline workers as well? And, and how, how do you think about flexibility in that context? Because let's be blunt, knowledge workers are, uh, have a more privileged position in a lot of ways in terms of the flexibility that they can be afforded. What are we doing to help and assist people who have hourly jobs that are on the front line to, for example, swap shifts uh, with one another? So thinking about what are the tools, technologies, techniques that are going to make their lives better as well. And that ties into the discussion earlier with Tom about the, the flexibility and, and labor arrangements and everything. Yep. Brian, thank you for coming, for flying in here. I know you, we got to go. You got to make your airplane. So okay, we'll thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, thanks excellent. All.